host, Alex Garrett. Well, anchors away to USNS Comfort. Thank you to them for all the care they brought this week and the last month to the city. Uh, it is a, a relief, so to speak, to see them go, maybe meaning things are are getting better here in the Tri-State area, here in New York City. And also on the Navy front, did you know the Navy, after the acting secretary was fired, has recommended the rehiring of Captain Crozier, the USS Roosevelt uh, captain who alerted, you know, upper management, hey, we've got a problem here. We've got COVID on the on the prowl here on our ship. Sure enough, sadly, one or at least one sailor has died on the USS Roosevelt, which is stationed in Guam. So possibly a return for Crozier, who simply pointed out, we've got a problem here. But right now, I want to get you to this interview with Dr. Dennis Durell. It's a huge, huge interview, and, and I don't want you to miss it right here on Spreaker right now. My goodness, we need a doctor's opinion on what the heck's going on around here, so thanks for joining. It's my pleasure. Good to be here. Sorry we missed earlier. It's all good. So tell me your, your field and where you come in and, and dealing with the coronavirus crisis. Well, I'm a hospitalist, and I'm the executive director for American Physician Partners, which is a national hospitalist and emergency room company. We have practices in 19 states. We have over 2,000 doctors. And my role now for COVID inside our company is leading our um, entire effort on treatment and protocols and the state of the art on uh, the best things that are coming out now for treating COVID-19. So I lead that task force and I lead two calls each week. Um, we're tracking all of our data uh, on all the patients that we have. We, we look at it every day. We see what they're being treated with. So, um, you know, that's my role right now. Uh, and I'm trained in internal medicine. Well, let's talk about that. So the treatments, you know, there's a lot of debate about it, but what is the, what, what are you seeing as a definitive way to improve ourselves? Well, you know, you got to put it, put everybody in different categories. I mean, remember that 80% of the people that get this will be fine. In fact, we're now learning with study after study, which I've been saying for a while, uh, that many people are asymptomatic, so they won't even know that they had it. So uh, if you're in that mild group, then, you know, as long as you're not having trouble breathing, as long as you're not um, passing out, having chest pain, anything like that, you know, you're in that mild group and you should just do supportive care, Tylenol. Um, you know, you can take some Zycam, which is zinc and maybe some vitamin C and just treat your symptoms, good rest, you'll be fine. So that's that group. Now, the people that have to come in the hospital, you know, that's a totally different group. Uh, right now, um, you know, if I were in the hospital and I were seriously ill, I would probably want remdesivir. It's the antiviral. Now, we don't have, you know, we've had two studies. Uh, again, no randomized controlled trials, just two series, uh, 53 patients, um, and another out of University of Chicago, 115 patients. And in seriously ill patients, it looks like it's doing well. Well, well, tell us about that. I mean, it, the remdesivir I've been hearing float around. I've, I've, I've got to ask you this hot button topic, which is chloroquine. Why, why the pushback? What's the deal? Is something working with it? What, what is your view on that? Well, my view, I'm not bullish. So I'm not a big fan of hydroxychloroquine. Uh, the reason is that I did some training in infectious disease, and, you know, it has – it's not really a natural antiviral agent. Uh, it's been tried in a lot of human viruses, and it's never worked. However, um, if you – you know, there was a study in China that showed that it worked. There was a study in France that showed it worked. Then there was another study in China that showed it didn't work. Another study in France didn't work. And, of course, the study that, to me, that's most powerful is the VA study. Um, they, gave, they looked at 368 VA patients, and the, the ones that had hydroxychloroquine uh, versus getting, getting it with azithromycin or getting nothing at all, neither one of those, uh, the group that got hydroxychloroquine had the highest mortality rate. So, you know, my feeling is right now do not use hydroxychloroquine with azithromycin 
So that's my recommendation. NAIH just came out with that recommendation. I've been telling my docs to be very careful and not use that. Uh, now, as far as just hydroxychloroquine, the data has not come in yet, so it's not definitive. But my gut feeling is it's not going to show a lot of uh, benefit. But we'll see. You know, the jury's still out. And I can tell you, a lot of our patients are getting it because they ask for it. Um, and, you know, the early indicators uh, are just too, too small numbers uh, in our experience to say. So the data out of New York will be very valuable. There's big trials going on right now, and we should get that in the next two weeks. So what was, you think, Cuomo's, uh, Governor Cuomo's anxiousness to get it? Like, what was his, what was his feeling? Yeah, I don't understand. You know, I, I guess... You know, I guess when anybody is facing something where there's no treatment and no cure, no vaccine, and then you had, you know, the trial came out of Marseille, France, it looked pretty good, and people were grabbing for straws, and then, of course, President Trump brought it up. So I think there was a lot of enthusiasm. There was a lot of hope for it, and, you know, they were going to take anything they could get. The problem is that remdesivir is very hard to get. Um, convalescent plasma. So plasma from someone that's already had and recovered, that's another treatment that I would personally want myself if I had it. That's hard to come by. And so I think what Cuomo was just, you know, look, it's available. Uh, it's pretty inexpensive. And I think early on people wanted it and they wanted to have access to it. And they were afraid that there wouldn't be enough. Now, my belief, as I mentioned, is that I think we're going to find out in the next two weeks with more data from New York that it probably didn't make much of a difference. Well, we will have to see. Now, I know that you, you mentioned you're part of the uh, hospital system. And so how are, I, I saw something where actually we were losing healthcare workers. We're, we're all cheering for them, but you're on the ground. What are you seeing with our workers? What are you seeing with them? What, how can we support them more than just cheering, if you ask me? Well, I mean, my, my bias is this. You know, we had a pandemic, and it'd be like having a blizzard in New York and in Idaho and then shutting down the schools in Miami. We essentially had regional outbreaks of a bad virus, and we had a cookie-cutter response to the entire United States. So why am I saying that? Because hospitals – so what am I seeing? I'm seeing rural hospitals, smaller hospitals – that are having to have lay off employees, furlough them, because we've canceled every elective surgery in the United States. And I think that we needed to be no more nuanced with that. Think about an area like West Virginia when you have a low incidence of COVID, you've got a hospital that depends on those elective surgeries, and they've got a thin margin of profitability, and there's plenty of PPE, plenty of operating rooms, ready to go, patients waiting to have it, but we shut that down. And so I think what I would say to help people in the hospital, um, if you're not in a hot spot and you have a surgery that's coming up, get it. If you have a heart attack like symptom, go to the hospital and, and don't avoid it. So I think what we can support it is really to go get the things done that we were going to have done. Well, this is the thing. So you're, you're also covering how these some of these procedures are being viewed as non-essential or non compared to COVID. They're all essential, so we should not discourage them from still getting it, right? I mean, that's been kind of a narrative uh, thrown out there. That is, and I and it's interesting. You know, I uh, wrote an op-ed about this uh, several weeks ago, and I've been a fan of just deciding community by community whether we stop elective surgeries and not everywhere. And it's funny, when you see the reopen plan, they literally say that. They say, hey, if you have these things, then go ahead and do elective surgeries. And I think we could have done that all along. So why were why, why the panic? Why was the media even telling us, don't do that? You can't do that. Like, it's, it it was, seems irresponsible at this point. Uh, I agree. I think there was a lot of fear-mongering, and I think some of that – came out of the fact, you know, you saw people on the beach in Clearwater where I lived in Tampa for many years. Now I live in Nashville. And you saw scenes of that here in Nashville. I saw, you know, people where kids were out, you know, on Broadway and kind of boasting about it. And I think once that kind of got into the zeitgeist, really, of the media, then everyone thought, wow, we need to scare everyone. I mean, and that became a scare tactic. And I think that's that's really where you got a lot of this.
Uh, and I, I'd like to comment also on the fact that I think that people have a narrative and they look at these studies and data and they want to use their narrative. For example, I've been saying all along many, many more people have this than we knew. Many more. And then the study came out of Santa Clara that showed that 4% of the population had it. Then it came out in L.A., L.A. County, USC did the same thing. And that meant many more people had it, and that meant the case fatality rate was lower. And what do you think epidemiologists jumped in and said, oh, those studies are flawed? Mm -hmm. Those studies are flawed. Why? Because if the mortality rate is lower, they're fearful that, again, everyone's going to relax. And so there's this narrative that we have to still be afraid. Now, you know with the data that came out of New York, 21% of the people in New York City have antibodies that are positive. It's amazing. It, it, that is, that's amazing to me. Yeah. Yeah. And, and now, now the epidemiologists that I argue with on Twitter, they can't, they can't <laughs> refute this now. Now they're seeing that it's definitely more in Miami. I just read Miami-Dade County, 6% positive. So again, they would have said, no, I was debating people. They said, oh, it's 1% at best. And so um, we, we have to just forget our narrative and look at the data. Well, let me ask you this then. How, how is it that we only find out this week, hey, you know what? The first death wasn't actually in the end of February. It was actually February 6th. Like, how does that happen? Uh, <laughs> it happens. And by the way, and, and you heard it here, but other people I'm sure are thinking it, they're looking earlier than February 6th now, and so they're looking at autopsies back into January now and seeing if there's any blood or any samples that they can do testing on. And so I think you're going to find something earlier than February 6th. So how did we miss it? You know, I was hearing from our doctors, hey, at the end of January, beginning of February, we were hearing that there was a pneumonia. They're, te they're coming in. We think they have flu. They test negative for flu. They've got a bad pneumonia. Um, they're coming back and they're failing, and we don't know what they have. You know, and if you if you talk to doctors across the country, everyone is saying that. And people in California are saying, you know, I read an article of someone that was really really sick with a pneumonia in January. They didn't know what it was. Had to be intubated. You know, so on a ventilator, flu negative. Now, what do you think the chances are of that person probably having COVID? And I think it's high. Well, let me tell you my personal experience. I was I was thinking, well, it's because my jacket's unzipped. It's in the middle of January. My jacket's unzipped. Two days later, I really wasn't feeling well, and I actually got my girlfriend and that household sick. I mean, my girlfriend's father's around, but, you know, he was sick for a few days. It was really – we didn't know what was going on, and I'm wondering if that was part of it. And so do you recommend, if you think you've had it, to get these antibody tests, or do we not even touch the tests? I mean, I'm kind of – in the mixed about that. I don't want to test, but maybe I should get the test for at least antibodies. I, yes. I mean, I think, um, it's funny, you know, we've been in quarantine now for, I mean, about six weeks really, um, here in Nashville. And, um, you know, my wife was convinced she had it. I kept telling her she didn't, but you know, as we, you know, as I've told her and, and I think, yes. So get the antibody test. See if and how do we do it. that? Because I don't know exactly the information on how to get that. Yeah, well, that's the trick. I mean, the trick is this. The antibody tests, uh, the FDA opened up and allowed quickly 90 companies to accelerate and offer their product for that. So you can imagine that there's just a lot of variability in quality. So um, unfortunately, many of these tests actually came out of China. They're home tests or they're very quick tests. They're what we call rapid tests. And here's the problem with those tests. They're not very accurate. So there's a lot, almost 30, 40, 50 percent false positives and false negatives both. And so to me, if I were going to get it, I would want to make sure that I would use a university near me. For example, Vanderbilt is near us. Stanford has a great test in New York. Mount Sinai, Mount Sinai has a good test. Mayo Clinic has a good test. I would get it done at a lab. I wouldn't do a rapid test. Uh, and I would seek towards my medical centers because they all have de are developing those tests. All right. Well, you know, it's interesting, and I don't know if there's any at-home tests for antibodies yet. That would be great. I guess we're already – There is. Okay. No, there is, but they're inaccurate. I, I wouldn't trust a home antibody test. I really would um, – well, let's put it this way. I wouldn't hang my hat on it. If it was positive, mm, probably, but if it's negative, you know, I'm not sure what to make of it. 
Well, is that part because of the conditions at home? Like, is that is that a big factor? No, it's just the fact that the tests are put together quickly. Um, they use reagents, and they're they're there, and it's in ELISA, uh, so it's an antibody kind of uh, something that's binding to antibodies. And there's just too many variabilities, too much variability in the companies that put them together quickly. So they haven't been verified and tested. And, you know, the FDA normally would do that. You'd never get some of these products out there, but the FDA said, hey, let's accelerate it. So I think you're just seeing a lot of um, poorly made tests. All right. Well, I'm talking with Dr. Dennis Durrell. He actually has the um, book out called Your Healthcare Playbook, Winning the Game of Modern Medicine. I want to talk to you about that as well. I mean, this book, would you say it came out at a perfect time for this kind of situation? Yeah, well, it came out a little while ago, so you know um, it wasn't out recently. But I still think it's extremely valuable now, of course. Uh, and you know, something that I talk about in the book uh, that I want to bring up is that um, you know when you're in the hospital, you and you can't have your family there, or your your relative is out of state. It's really hard for you to um, you know always convey the right information that the doctor said. So. In the book, I talk about reviewing the film. So I created an app that I'd like to bring up because I think it's timely. It's called My Doc Replay. It's free oh, wow. on, yeah, it's free. It's on Apple, so you can get it on Android or Apple on the App Store. And it's a really cool app because what it allows you to do is take a video of your doctor during the visit, and then you can immediately share it with anybody that's your contact, so your daughter. So, for example, my dad is in Georgia, and when he sees his cardiologist, he takes a video, and then um, they send me the video, and I can watch the video of what the doctor said, and then I can explain it to my dad. Oh, my god! Now, gosh. you might – yeah, that's amazing. So it's a, and it's a great app now because why? Because families are not allowed to visit the hospital now. Families are not allowed to visit nursing homes. And so when the doctor comes in, if you have my app, my doc replay, then you can make record the visit and share it instantly. Now you might say, well, why don't I just take a video on my phone and share it? Well, doctors are not going to like that. They like the fact that it's inside a secure app like my doc replay. Well, well, that's amazing. By the way, it reminds me. So my, uh, we never got a copy of it, but my doctor, when I was really sick as a kid with urology issues. He would record it on his recorder and just dictate notes that way, and I, I, that just reminds me of that. But this is so much more advanced. And I wondered if it was HIPAA law to even record my telehealth I just had last month ago. I don't know if there's any ex exceptions for that. I don't know. Maybe you can give us – if we have telehealth, can we yeah. record it? Well, see, that's the thing. I mean uh, if you use my app and you record just your telehealth visit and just tell your doctor – then then you can have it and share it. And our app is HIPAA compliant. You could share it with anyone. Wow. So, um, yeah, so I, I think that's the way to go. Um, and, you know, we poll doctors. Some people say, well, my doctor doesn't want to videotape because he'll get sued. Well, you know, most doctors, so seven out of ten are fine with making a recording. Uh, and we do say you can't use it in a court of law. So it's something new. We developed this app before the pandemic, but right now it's specifically really helpful because if you know how it is, if your wife is there or your relatives there, it's another set of ears. So once the doctor comes in and no one's there to visit, then you record the visit and send it, and then you're all on the same page. Well, that is um, that's really good. And again, do not shy away from telehealth, right? I mean, this is the thing. People are you know people are being told. That nothing matters anymore. It's only COVID. We're not even going to do DNIs for heart attacks. And I just feel like, no, we have other health issues that we need to talk about. And so I think you're inspiring people to still keep up with their health. Please. You know, in the op-ed, I talked about the fact that heart attacks are supposedly down 40%. Now, these are studies. They looked at 12 major centers around the U.S., and heart attacks were down 40%. Well, we know that they didn't stop. They're not really down 40%. They're just not coming in. And again, talking to my father's cardiologist recently, she saw a case of a man that was at home, had chest pain, and he just thought it was COVID, was afraid to come in, comes in four days later, and now he's going to have permanent heart failure, which could have been prevented had he come in right away. So another thing that I'm a little disappointed 
about the messaging is that this lock in, lock down, stay at home, mm-hmm. safer at home. Yeah, not not if you're having a heart attack or stroke, because chances are your emergency room is actually half empty now. And so it was a lose lose. You've got people staying home. They've got critical disease. We can treat it. They think their emergency room is overwhelmed. It's not. It's empty. And it was kind of the worst of all scenarios. Well, I'm glad you brought up the whole lockdown thing. So as as these results come in with antibodies, as these results come in, I had said too much criticism that people are going to logically wonder why we're still locked in if all these positives are coming out. So what's your reaction to that? Well, I think that that's exactly right. I think that there's going to be, first of all, let's remember a couple things. Children basically don't get this at all, or even if they do, it's such a mild, mild case. So you automatically have now children that should be able to move about. Then you have the people that have had it that should be able to move about, and you could prove that with antibodies. And then you have people that are young and very healthy. Again, that's not 100%. But all of a sudden now you have a group that should be able to start moving about. So I couldn't agree more. You know, I couldn't agree more um, that I think many more people have had it. And I think it is time to start moving about. But we've got to be ready to retract it if we see any changes. How about this? Why not? I, I love the plan earlier where they said, you know what, why not we just give people masks, go to work in masks, and then come back home in masks. And then, and then that could be a solution. Oh, I definitely agree. I think masks are huge. I've been a proponent from the beginning, particularly in our hospitals, because so many people are asymptomatic. So I think that we can be smart. We can use social distancing so we don't need to be on top of each other at work, Um, wear a mask. I mean, think about it. I go into my office. I see people, but I can sit six feet away from them. I can wear a mask and I can come home. And why shouldn't I be doing that? So I think a lot of people are starting to ask that question now. If we if we use common sense and we're smart, then I think we can do that. But remember, the key thing is if we see a change in the numbers, then we've got to be able to, to withdraw and back up. So look at China right now. Look at Harbin. So the city of in Harbin, northern China, has 10 million people, and now they have a new outbreak. They've got 1,500 people that are being tested right now. And that's because someone came across the border, likely from Russia. And so that's going to probably happen in the U.S. You'll probably see, okay, maybe in July we have some outbreak in Cleveland, Tennessee, or wherever. And then we're going to have to start to locally change and lock down again. And that's going to happen throughout the fall. All right, let's talk about a couple more things. If you have a a few minutes, this is just fascinating stuff because it's stuff I'm not hearing anywhere, honestly, on on TV screens. Uh, Harvard comes out with this huge study that says – 2022, and I feel like the the message behind that, would you agree, was that we have to lock, stay locked in until 2022? I mean, th- why else would they release something like that? <laughs> I couldn't believe that study. I mean, I, I mean, I, let's put it this way. I think in public health, you probably have to over over claim, you know, the danger, and then hope that it's much better. And I get that, um, but I think that's just absurd. I mean, the thought of and they wanted nine million dollars on top of that. (laughs) Exactly. I mean, it was just. I mean, why don't we just say we'll stay inside until 2025? You know, why don't we say that school shootings have gone to zero? Why don't we say that car accidents and trauma have gone to zero? It seems like we've solved all the world's ills by just not going out of our house for five years. But we know that's just ridiculous. It, it is. And then we've got politicians saying, well, you could stay in. You know, Speaker Pelosi says, why not? We don't have to rush out the door. Uh, I think we do, Speaker. Now, I don't know how political you get in your interviews, but there is a factor that's become political. And it's, that's problematic to me. Like everybody should be on the same page. And yet we're not. I think, you know, look, when I trained and I did a year of infectious disease training at UNC Chapel Hill when I was a chief resident, And at that time, I treated a lot of AIDS patients, and the guru that we looked up to was Tony Fauci. I mean, Tony Fauci is kind of, I don't know, the godfather of infectious diseases, and I trust him. So I I like keeping it away from politics, more towards what Tony's saying, Um, and I think that that if you have a narrative politically, you're going to just look at this data and interpret it your way, and I think we're getting so much of that. Well, I have to push back a little bit because when he says the economy 
Uh, I don't know. It, it just seems like he still doesn't want to find a way to get us out and build the economy again. Am I missing that point? No, I think you're right. But I think Tony Fauci is more measured than that Harvard study. Absolutely. And I think what I think what Tony is saying, I you know, I think I guess let, let me put it differently. I think that Trump, President Trump needs to take what Tony Fauci is saying and then blend it what with what his social scientists, his economists are saying, and then take a holistic approach on what we should do. And I, and all, my only point is that from the science side, I like hearing from Tony Fauci, but I don't think Tony has the final decision because he's he's an, a doctor. You know, he's a scientist of medicine. Uh, he's not a scientist, a, a social scientist of how an economy and and what, what the effects of this. And I think that you know, that we need to start to move to open. And I think he's in agreement with that. I think what Tony Fauci said is that some places are not ready and they're opening. And I do agree with Georgia. Yeah, being I mean, too the, the Georgia thing is just insane. Yeah. Yeah, I agree with that. And look, Tennessee is doing it the right way, in my opinion. So what they're looking at is something called the R naught. The R naught or the reproductive number. What that means is if I have COVID, how many people will I give it to? So if the R naught is three, I'm going to give it to three people. And when that R naught is less than one, so when I would give it to less than one person, then a virus tends to, to, to go down or disappear. And so that's a great indicator of when to open a society, an economy. And, and what they've done in Tennessee is they've done R naughts by region. Some regions are ready, some are not. And you can divide a state and do that. And so even where I live near Nashville, we're not going to open as soon as other areas. Okay, there are some in your profession. But by the way, speaking of Nashville, you guys had this tragic death of a 21-year-old girl who went on social media, kind of said this isn't real, then she passed away. And that sort of was a staple of what was going on in Tennessee people's minds, I guess. I don't know. It made national news anyway. Yeah, well, I think that's what I— you know, I think that's what I was alluding to is that I think that young people— uh, we're too cavalier with this early on, and I think that's where the media or others driving the message, they were saying, well, we have to scare, we have to scare people, and you know, it's kind of like me. If I see a patient, and I see them not changing their behavior, and it, and it's really could be very very dangerous for them, I end up saying, hey, I need to let you know, if you keep doing that, you could you could die, and once you say that, you know then you, 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 it's kind of the last straw, but you have to use it sometimes to motivate people. And I think we kind of over overplayed that message early on. Oh, my goodness. I, can I tell you a personal story? Um, my doctor five years ago said, you know, we want to keep you on this planet and you want to leave it. And that message has stuck with me because I was a stubborn, what, 22, 23-year-old back then to take care of my health. So I totally get what you're saying about driving yes. the point home. Uh, well, a couple more things. CDC models. Some of the, in your profession say they the models were wrong. It sounds like you'd agree that they were right on point, or were they somewhat faulty? What What about that? Well, there were so many models, and the early models weren't even based on COVID. It was based on influenza, um, and so I think some of them were. You know, they were estimating three million people would die in the U.S. Um, you know, I think that if you think about the worst pandemics that we've had, um, the Spanish flu, a million, you know, the 1957, two million worldwide. So to think that we'd have three million die in the U.S. was, I think, off. So but I think the problem is that the data wasn't based on covid per se. It was based on influenza because we didn't have enough data. And then the data that we got was from China. The China data you can't really count on. They've already corrected and added something like 4,000 deaths to Wuhan, which was a 40 percent increase. So you can see that I think the models were fraught with those problems early on. Well, I thought they were they were going to um, they were they were very specific in that this was COVID and nothing else. That was my original thought process on the models. No, no, no. The original early models. So the early models were not based on COVID. Um, actual COVID. And the newer models, they are. And I think the one model out of University of Washington, a lot of people are following, 
Um, I think it's the IMAT model. Um, you know, it's predicting something, and it's been revised week by week, but something like 66,000 deaths in the U.S. Again, tragic that we had one. But I, I'm in favor. That's the model that's closest for me. We're at 50,000 now. I have felt we're going to come in somewhere, depending on when you stop the clock, somewhere around you know, 85,000 by the time it's all said and done. And I think that's probably the most accurate model. Okay, so why, why, how are we able to still be the lowest? I mean, of course, one death, but it seems like we were still the lowest globally, or is that, where are we right now in reality uh, compared to the global stage? Well, it depends on, you know, it depends on how you measure how we're doing. Um, you know, once it's all said and done, I think that we're going to end up not being the best. I think that countries like South Korea, like Taiwan, um, like Germany, they were – and now they're smaller than us. Um, but they were able to jump on this. They used very restrictive um, kind of draconian measures, uh, and they were able to mitigate much of their, their disease. Um, we're not going to be in that class. However, for the countries that got it and got it badly, like Spain, uh, like Italy – uh, you know, I think we're going to end up, our mortality will be less, quite a bit less than theirs. There was a lot of mortality in Italy because, of course, the northern region, Lombardy, uh, was overwhelmed. And we never, even our peak, New York City had a lot of cases, but we were never in New York City the way, we weren't in the shape that they were in, in Italy. So I think we're going to end up faring better than, than those countries. That's a quotable. We weren't in the shape of Italy and we were in New York City, the epicenter. That is that is remarkable to hear. Yes. Well, the problem with New York, you know, and two of my children live in New York. Um, uh, the problem with New York is that people were still coming into New York from Europe and they weren't being screened. And there were so many people, so many more that had it early on than we knew. Uh, and that's where it got out of control. So. That's why now 21% of New York City uh, has already had antibodies, and that's 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 just logical. By the way, in case people don't know, they've been protesting all week long, and uh, I don't know. I don't agree with the protesting either. Of course, they have a right to voice their disagreement, but um, I shouldn't say I disagree. I should say it was they have to be careful doing it, right? I mean, what would you? What are your views on the protests? Um. I'm not a huge fan of the protests right now. You know, I think that you can express your um, displeasure in other ways. It's probably more effective to write a letter to your congressman uh, than, you know, a true letter than to go out on the street like that. I think that it's just it's not wise. We had to lock down. And if you think we didn't have to lock down, look at San Francisco. I mean, there are a number of deaths. I mean, I, I want to say they have like 30 deaths in just all of San Francisco. So there's no doubt we had to lock down. I wish we had nuanced the message, as I mentioned, but we had to do it. And I think that, you know, it's a little premature in some places. And when the government, you know, when this when the when the people, you know, say that this is the right thing to do, um, I just think right now uh, there's too much confusion going on i don't think it's the right time to protest protest you know maybe three weeks from now four weeks well and of course protests uh if you disagree with the way the leadership anywhere not just presidential because we know those people are going to be protesting his reaction to it too but you know on the local level as well uh protest them now cdc guidelines they're out can what when do we see them really come into play and reopenings happen um for sure Oh, well, you know, the guidelines are out to reopen America. Um, everyone's got their gates. They've got to get through the gates. So you've got to have decreasing 14 days of influenza-like illnesses, decreasing 14 days of COVID positives. You've got to have uh, an effective way to test and to contact and trace and isolate. And then your hospitals have to be fine. So, you know, the question is how many states are ready to do that? You know, I think that there are states today that that can do that, and there are others. It's a little early. Uh, there are other states politically that are just gonna, they're just gonna extend it. In my opinion, just because Pritzker you know, just extended it in uh, Illinois, I was kind of mind blown by that. Yeah, I think 
again, this is where the politics come in. If you really want to make a statement, then you're just going to keep things locked down for much, much longer maybe than you need to out of the abundance of caution to kind of say, hey, I'm, I know more than you do. Uh, in my state does. And that's fine. You know, maybe the people in the state want to be more cautious. But in my opinion, to answer your question, you know, I think the second week of May, you know, I think most places should be, you know, ready to do that. But they've got to have those gated things done that I mentioned. And sports, where, where do we see sports? What uh, everybody wants to know. Yeah, that's the great question. I'd like to know, too. You know, my book I wrote with the NFL. So, um, big NFL fan. Um, you know, I I think it's too soon to know. I think we'll definitely have an NFL season. I think it won't be a full season per se it, as we know it. Um, we may play without fans in the stadium. We may have um, fans that are distanced or every five seats or, you know, we, we may do something like that. But, I, you know, I don't see the fall. I don't see August and September being normal i think maybe by the in october uh we may start to see normal sports wait wait say that one more time just so people know uh, i do not believe at, in august we'll have what okay. we normally would see with preseason nfl i i don't but i and i and i don't think in september but my my guess is by october um with all the trajectories going down now keep in mind that these things never go away. Something like this is still in our population, and it probably will have embers that spark up in the fall. Um, so, so for example, let's say that you know we have preseason without fans. Let's say in September we have um, you know a certain amount of fans with some other uh, rules in place, uh, and then October comes and we feel better and we're having full regular NFL games. But then imagine if we have an outbreak in Charlotte, for example, then we're not going to have fans at like a Panthers game. And I think we might have in other places. Well, I that would be interesting if some were attended, some not. And I got to ask you this. How'd you link up with the NFL? That's very interesting. Yeah. Well, you should have me on another time to talk about that. Yes, but please. The, real qu the quick story is that, um, you know, as an expert on the Affordable Care Act and what was happening at the time, I did a fellowship at UC San Francisco, and I realized that the way we were going in healthcare, that football was a great analogy. And I wrote an email to Roger Goodell, and his medical director of the NFL, Elliot Pellman, sent me, called me, actually called me back, and uh, he said, "Hey, why don't you come down to the Breakers at the NFL owners meeting?" And I went down there, and that was it. And from then on, I. I went to New York City and I met with their marketing department and their communications department, and they hooked me up with uh, different teams and uh, presidents of teams and uh, players, and I got you know passes for the media to the Super Bowl and did interviews. So I, they were really great. Who's your team? I got. Oh, I'm sorry. Obviously Tennessee, or is it Tampa Bay? Because you were growing up in Tampa Bay. Which is I'm it? I'm a Titans fan now. I'm a Titans fan. Well, you know, Tannehill is actually not a bad guy. I mean, he was impressed. He was Miami was, you know, disregarded. But in Tennessee, he really showed himself this year. He really did. But I, if you recall, I said I, I came to Nashville from Tampa. Right, right. So I am I'm still a bit of a Bucks fan, although my favorite team now is officially the Titans. But the fact that they're going to have Brady and Gronk <laughs> and, and uh, I'm not a Bucks <laughs> fan anymore is is unbelievable. Well, by the way, he just broke out his Bucks jersey as he was saying that. So don't don't kid yourself, <laughs> folks. <laughs> hey, that's and, right. That's right. Well, so we won't be seeing the NFL draft tonight, but we know that you're a big fan. We know you wrote this with the NFL. And yes, come back as we see developments, as we see plans continue to unfold for the NFL. I think you've had you've got some insight that we may not have anywhere else. So we'll definitely, you. I can I can talk about that and talk about. Uh, sneaking into uh, one of the receptions at the NFL owners meeting and meeting Roger Goodell. It was great. Well, that is awesome. Thank you so much, Dr. Dennis Durrell. Where can we find you on Twitter, Facebook? What, what's your socials? Yeah, um, it's um, at Dr. Durrell is my Twitter. Follow me on Twitter. I put stuff up all, all day long. Um, my website is DennisDurrellMD.com. And don't forget to download my doc replay. It's for free. It's, it's totally free. 
so that you can record conversations and share them with your family. And by the way, I would say based on this conversation, you encourage people to still get out, get the sunlight, get the get get air into your lungs, people, right? Yes, get outside. There's nothing wrong with it. And and probably the best thing I could say is, hey, if you're going to get this thing, you want to be aerobically in shape because your lungs are going to get, unfortunately, the work out of their life. So get out there and get exercise. Hey, thank you so much, Dr. Durrell. We will definitely have you back. And this has been a later edition of Keeping Real with Alexander Garrett. We will talk to you tomorrow. Thank you. Wow.